Life is filled with suffering. Some might think that everything is meaningless. I mean, what actually is the point of it all? Why do we exist? What is human nature? Why are you watching this video? Am I even making a point in this intro? <laughs> Sorry about that, I made my inner nihilist come out. Um, it's easy to fall into existential dread, especially when certain people have been a massive dicks to you. But in my opinion, a true hero is someone who says Stop right there, criminal scum! and voluntarily steps up to the challenge. Someone who has the bravery to leave their comfort zone and discover who they truly are. Someone who doesn't get overwhelmed by malevolence. Someone who overcomes their suffering to reach their full potential. Someone who forges their own meaning. Someone who embraces their innermost and incomparable uniqueness to their full potential. Okay, you get the fucking point already. I'm, I'm talking about Guts. Guts is the guy who does this. That's why he's the true hero. Yeah, I'm just gonna kind of backtrack on what I said last video. <laughs> Essentially, the point I'm trying to make is be like this guy, not like this guy. Wait a second there, you f- The definition of a hero is a person who is admired for their courage, outstanding achievements, or noble qualities. So, is Guts more heroic because he's brave? Well, so is Griffith. Is it because he's strong? Griffith has the power to bend fucking space. Is it because of his outstanding achievements? Well, Griffith kind of created a mini paradise. Is it because of his noble quali- Oh, fuck off, we know Guts has none of those. From this definition, doesn't that mean Griffith is more of a hero than Guts? Well, from its definition, that may be true. Or is it? No. Griffith meets the dictionary requirements of a hero, but that's kind of entirely superficial. When you think about the mythological hero, there's something about it that resonates with the human psyche on such a profound level that I think it goes a bit deeper than liking someone brave enough to do cool shit sometimes. Sure, Griffith can be superficially seen as a hero, but that's only because he puts on the persona of one. Very few people know the, the real, real Griffith. The Griffith that self-harms to repress his emotional pain. The Griffith that loses his composure as he's overtaken with primal desire. And the Griffith that rapes a woman that looked up to him as a means to despite his best friend. And some of the more cynical sociopaths out there might be saying, oh, so what? Griffith did some bad things. So did Guts as well. And I mean, that's true. Guts did do some some bad things. <laughs> no, no, no. But let me ask you this. Did Griffith learn anything from his mistakes? Or did he just cling to his childhood persona? Did he try to face his emotional pain? Or did he just repress and ignore those feelings? Did he take personal responsibility for the things he did? Or was he overwhelmed by his libido? Did he try to better himself through his own free will? Or did he just, you know, give in to causality and use that as an excuse? I'm pretty sure you know the answers to all of these. If, if you didn't, then it's, <coughs> yeah, it was these ones. Guts and Griffith face similar circumstances, but make different choices. They both pursue their own reasons to live, face their breaking points, undergo a lot of suffering, and either take personal responsibility or put the responsibility outside of themselves on an evil god organ entity or something. Basically, these are challenges that can't be overcome with just the swing of a sword. Griffith may embody the persona of a mythical hero, but he loses the internal battles where Guts wins. Berserk isn't about being seen as a hero externally, but about being a hero internally. It's not about looking perfect, but about psychologically growing from internal conflicts. Seeing as we're talking about psychology, let's get a bit 200 IQ. There was once a big brain chap called Carl Jung, who I've been obsessing over a bit recently. He was a Swiss psychiatrist from the 20th century and believed that every person is unique and has a distinct destiny, and the best pathway to achieve your full potential is to undergo something called individuation. This is defined as a process of psychological integration whereby the personal and collective unconscious are brought into consciousness and assimilated into the whole personality, thereby making you distinct from the general collective psychology. What the fuck does that mean? <clears throat> okay, maybe I'll try and simplify it. It's basically a process of self-realization where you try and reach your full potential. You do this by making the unconscious parts of yourself, basically all the shit that you aren't aware of or don't understand, conscious. Jung says the unconscious contains unrealized potential, and discovering these potentials can lead to a personal transformation. Basically, by making the unconscious conscious, you realize that you are kind of a special snowflake, but you can only do that by breaking away from the collective, leaving your comfort zone, going down your own path, facing the unknown, not repressing shit, discovering all the things about yourself and the world that you'd rather not know of, integrating that into your personality, and eventually becoming your own person. The process isn't easy, and you will probably 
suffer a lot, but it does provide a decent guideline to find meaning in your life and discover who you truly are. Well, I, I mean it's either that or existential dread. Well Jung relates this process of individuation to the journey of the mythological hero. And you know who else does this? Well, Miura definitely read up his fucking Jungian psychology. <laughs> there are quite a few references in the manga, and most importantly, he applies this concept of individuation to the journey of Guts and Griffith. So let's relate this to Griffith. Griffith! He did some of this. He isn't part of a collective, but goes down his own path, which is pretty good. He determines and pursues his own reason to live, which is the first vital step of individuation. So he's actually doing quite well until he fails at everything else. He fails for two reasons. Firstly, he repressed emotions that were too difficult to deal with. Rather than looking inwards and making the unconscious conscious, he kind of just kept the unconscious unconscious. No! No, don't do it! We see this when he self-harms, he does this as a kind of coping mechanism for emotional stress. Such as, you know, when he felt a bit guilty for causing thousands of deaths and when he had to sleep with a rather mature gentleman. Oh, and when he gets dumped by his boyfriend as well. He uses physical pain to distract himself from his emotional pain, but that's still kind of avoiding the issue. He never tries to confront his pain directly, speak about it, or even come to terms with it. He just leaves things unresolved. This brings us to our second issue. He identifies too much with his persona of the unwavering, limitless, and unbeatable commander of the Band of the Hawks. Jung says a persona isn't a true reflection of who you actually are, but a mask that you put on in front of other people. Griffith thinks it's necessary to keep up this act in order to achieve his dream. He wants to come off as plausibly strong to keep morale high and to take advantage of people, but because of this, he hides his vulnerabilities from himself and others. Griffith Griffith thinks, oh, oh the, the, the leader of the Banner of the Hawk needs to be strong and ambitious, so let me just, you know, ignore all these other emotions. He's been doing this since he was a kid, so it's culminated into something problematic. Besides from his ambition, he doesn't really know how to interpret his other feelings or emotions. When he's not putting on his facade, he can act childish, overly possessive, and impulsive. He normally doesn't have the words to explain what he's feeling, doesn't really know how to handle it, and can get easily overwhelmed. If you never face your internal issues, then you can never grow from them, and therefore identifying with this persona has repressed his individuality and left Griffith psychologically stunted. This is important as I think I think this emotional immaturity is why he could never understand his feelings towards Guts. Griffith eventually believed he was unbeatable and limitless, but then he realised he was kind of beatable and limited. Who Griffith identified as wasn't a true reflection of himself or even reality. The battle on the hilltop wasn't just a battle between Guts and Griffith, but a battle between Griffith's persona and reality. He lost the physical battle and the internal battle. His sword was broken and so was his facade. For the first time, the Banner of the Hawks saw Griffith vulnerable and defeated, and he couldn't handle that. He was too emotionally immature to properly confront his pain, so he acted impulsively and fucked everything up. Griffith was overwhelmed by what Jung would call the shadow. This is basically the part of your unconscious where you repress all your unpleasant desires and emotions. You normally hide these thoughts from society because otherwise people will see you for the horrible human being you actually are. But there's an issue. Just like my crippling need for anime thighs, the more you repress it, the stronger it becomes. Strong enough to momentarily overwhelm your conscious personality if you're at your breaking point. This is what happened to Griffith. All the malice, jealousy, and regret he repressed into his shadow to keep up his facade overwhelmed him, causing him to act in impulsively. He slept with the princess because he wanted control and dominance after losing his confidence. He self-harmed to repress the emotional pain of Guts leaving, and he got captured and pretty much said, Fuck the king. Jung says we shouldn't ignore or repress our shadow, but we should try and understand it and allow those thoughts to be accommodated in a socially acceptable way. He says this will make you more self-accepting and less likely to be overwhelmed by your shadow. So what, what am I saying? Well, Griffith didn't do this. Griffith did some things wrong, and they were entirely his fault. <laughs> He failed to understand himself and to undergo individuation. And it's a shame because I feel like Griffith had the chance to emotionally mature through his friendship with Guts. Guts was the catalyst for emotionally developing Griffith because he was the only person who understood him beyond his persona. 
He was the reason Griffith kept his sanity during his torture, and he even made him question the value of his own dream. This is because, in my opinion, Guts made Griffith feel more fulfilled than his dream ever did. When Griffith was shown this vision during the eclipse, which was basically his shadow, the pathway to his dream was always a lonely one. He needed to view everyone as a corpse to be stepped over because that's what his dream required of him. But despite all the corpses, you notice that there's one person who's still alive here, Guts. He's on a separate pathway, but he's not opposing his dream like Griffith believed. He's not viewing Griffith as a miraculous saint and giving up his life for him, but instead treating him as a person, an equal, a friend. Whilst the God Hand spoke to Griffith definitively, saying it's too late to regret and he has no choice but to pile up the corpses, Guts simply encourages Griffith to follow his ambition. The God Hand implies Griffith has no choice as if this is part of causality, whereas Guts implies Griffith made this choice out of his own free will, and respects him for that. And that's what makes Guts irreplaceable to Griffith. He's someone who encouraged him beyond his persona, gave him company on his lonely path, and brought out the individuality he repressed. Griffith can understand these feelings Guts gave him because it was strange for someone unfamiliar with human emotion to be, well, overwhelmed with human emotion. If he didn't repress his pain but chose to face it and understand it instead, maybe he could have figured out what he truly valued maybe he wouldn't have sacrificed. Griffith clung on to what he knew, but valued less, his dream and persona, rather than what he valued more, but didn't understand, his friendship with Guts. After the eclipse, Griffith is pretty much the embodiment of his persona. He now really is limitless, strong, and pretty much unbeatable. He has the qualities to achieve his dream, but it's at the cost of abandoning uh, pretty much everything else. Jung said the task in life is not to be perfect, but to be whole. Griffith may seem perfect, but he definitely isn't whole. He's still fragmented, he takes on two forms, one representing his persona, and one representing his shadow. He never really grew as a person. If Griffith wanted to gain true fulfilment in his life, he should have prioritised guts over his dream. This is why Griffith fails to be a true hero. However, there's one big jawline chap that does succeed. I mentioned that a true hero is someone who goes their own path and brings their unconscious into consciousness. Well, unlike Griffith, Guts did both of these. We all know he left the Band of the Hawk to pursue his own meaning, but what's interesting is that as soon as he gains independence, he enters a forest. Now you might wonder what's so interesting about a fucking forest, Soul. Well, Jung implies a hero entering a forest after leaving everything behind is more than just a literal journey through a forest after leaving everything behind. It's a metaphor for a journey through your mind into your unconscious. <clears throat> The hero is said to find creatures in the forest, some dangerous and some helpful that give him special weapons and resources. <coughs> it's also said that the hero will gain wisdom from the people he encounters, and will leave the forest more self-aware. <coughs> What the hero finds in the forest is all a metaphor for how the individual is receptive to the unconscious. If you accept what's there, then it helps you realise your unique potential. Guts left everything behind not just to go his own path, but also to understand himself. And I mean, that's essentially the process of bringing your unconscious into consciousness. Alright, maybe you're not convinced, let's <laughs> ignore forest metaphors for a bit then. Let's get more specific. Guts doesn't identify with his persona of the Black Swordsman, and he learns to open up about his emotions. Guts initially repressed his trauma with Gambino and, uh, Donna, and this had a bad outcome. He had nightmares that directly represented the repressed thoughts in his unconscious, and he lashed out when he was touched. When Guts had sex with Casca, the thoughts in his shadow literally override his consciousness, just like it did with Griffith. This is called being shadow-possessed, and it causes people to act more impulsive, destructive, aggressive, and, uh, Horny. Of course, Guts' possession was personalised from his own shadow. He sees his younger self in Casca and strangles her because of his past trauma. But he stops himself. He opens up and talks about something he'd repressed his entire life. He shows vulnerability and doesn't hide anything, and Casca accepts him. There was no persona here. Guts emotionally matured because he opened up to someone he cared for, and in return, she cared for him. 
Maybe this would have been the case for Griffith if he prioritised his friendship with Guts. This moment was meaningful for Guts and Casca, whereas Griffith sleeping with the princess was entirely meaningless. Guts won the internal battle against his shadow, whilst Griffith lost. This is called integrating your shadow, and Jung says this is part of the process of individuation. Another example of this is Guts, uh, pretty much the entirety of the Black Swordsman arc. He was motivated entirely by hate, and didn't care if other people got caught up in his revenge. He repressed his thoughts of the Eclipse, and avoided Casca because he couldn't face his emotional pain. He had a lonely self-destructive dream, viewing every demon as a corpse and a pathway to get his revenge on Griffith. <coughs> He put on a persona, repressed his emotional pain, and was constantly overwhelmed by his shadow. As a result, he stunted his psychological growth. <coughs> he prioritised his dream over those irreplaceable to him. <coughs> if he carried on further down this path, he would have been completely devoured by the Beast of Darkness, which represents his dark desires, and is literally in his shadow. <coughs> <coughs> A lot of people criticise this arc, saying it's pointless because it involves Guts just randomly killing demons, but this part of the story being pointless is the exact point. Miura isn't saying this is the right path for Guts to go down. Oh, he suddenly stops developing, emotionally maturing and acting like a hero when his actions are dictated by his hatred. Oh, well, imagine my shock. I'm not saying his hate isn't justified, I'm just saying this self-destructive pathway parallels with Griffith's. That's why he encounters similar internal problems, and why his ambition is ultimately pointless in making him feel truly fulfilled. Miura is showing us that Guts stops developing as a character, as soon as he stops undergoing the process of individuation. And when does his character start developing again? Oh, oh yeah, when he does that individuation thing again. Luckily Guts wasn't too far gone by this point. He matured, realised his limitations, and adopted a sense of humility. At the crucial moment, he decided to take responsibility for his fate in his own hands without his shadow dictating his actions. He prioritised Casca, someone irreplaceable to him, over his dream. He no longer repressed his issues, but faced his emotional pain head on. He keeps his humanity by looking inwards something Griffith couldn't do. Oh yeah, and, and after he saves Casca, he, he enters a forest and gains new equipment and shit. The Berserker armor is like the most obvious metaphor for Guts integrating his shadow. When Guts is devoured by his rage, he's self-destructive, but if he controls it, he can use that strength constructively. Hmm. I mean, we even see Shiaka literally enter his psyche. She sees Guts being overwhelmed by the thoughts in his shadow and the memories in his unconscious. And we even see this symbol which is like an exact fucking parallel of Jungian symbolism. And Guts gains control by making the unconscious conscious. Shiaka delving into his unconscious is kind of a metaphor for the importance of opening up to others, and it also shows the importance of Casca. She prevents Guts from being overwhelmed by his trauma, and is the catalyst for him to strive towards a heroic ambition, rather than an ambition dictated by revenge. Guts places the responsibility for evil within himself, <coughs> unlike someone, and it's this humility that he eventually gains that makes him so endearing. Oh yeah, and there's also some subtle and not so subtle use of mythological symbolism that Miura uses, such as Guts' sword being called the Dragon Slayer. In European myth, a dragon is the culmination of every natural predator that humans shit themselves over. It's kind of ingrained in our biology that we should be scared of birds, snakes, and fire, because evolution. Slaying a dragon represents conquering your fear and overcoming adversity which is, you know, normally a thing mythological heroes like to do. It's also a metaphor for personal growth by integrating your unconscious, so <clears throat> not that fucking subtle there, Miura. Another common example is the hero waking up the sleeping princess. <sighs> Yeah, it's basically Guts and Casca. Normally, the princess is under some sort of spell, and the hero takes many steps to end up freeing her. This is a metaphor for integrating a thing that Jung calls the anima, which is something I don't fully understand, but I'll give it an explanation anyway. The anima represents the inner femininity in a man, and governs things like mood, openness, intuition, and capacity for love. It represents a man's relationship to a woman, and also his 
soul. Basically, ever since Guts went on this journey with Casca, he's become a lot more contemplative, self-accepting, compassionate, empathetic, and capable of healthy relationships. This could be interpreted as him integrating the anima, and Jung says that once a hero achieves this, the sleeping princess will awaken. Oh, and now that he's achieved this, Casca is awake. Yeah, de definitely just a fucking coincidence, guys. One last example of symbolism is, quote, The hero travels by ship, fights a sea monster, is swallowed, and having arrived inside the belly of the whale, seeks the vital organ and cuts it off, thereby winning release. We see Griffith kind of get in a situation like this. I mean, it is canon that he enters the deepest layer of the astral realm and meets a giant fucking organ god. This myth is supposed to represent the death and rebirth of a hero, and whilst this is kind of the case, it's more of a regression for Griffith, in my eyes. I think he was swallowed by the monster named Causality, but instead of vanishing it, he gave in to it and got overwhelmed by a shadow. His perspective didn't really develop after this. He believes nothing has changed and he doesn't really regret anything now. In other words, the only person who would unironically say Griffith did nothing wrong is Griffith himself. It's interesting as Guts was in a very similar situation to this. I mean, there's a point where he literally travels by ship, fights the sea monster, is swallowed, seeks the vital organ, cuts it off, and is released. Both Guts and Griffith get metaphorically devoured by the monster, but Guts is the one who metaphorically vanishes it and slays it with his metaphorical sword called the Dragon Slayer, being metaphorically reborn on his journey to wake up the metaphorically sleeping princess. I hope you get the fucking metaphor. It's commentary on how they both face similar heroic trials, but Guts is the only one who succeeds in overcoming his adversity, not just because of his physical strength, but because of his internal strength. Griffith may have power, respect, and a kingdom, but he doesn't have the humanity, wholeness, and self-acceptance Guts has. I believe that even if Griffith takes over the entire world, he will never be fulfilled, because he threw away something irreplaceable. People admire Griffith for his persona, not for his true self. And people admire Guts, not for his persona, but for the person he truly is. I think why I find Griffith so interesting is that his internal conflicts are so universally human. And it's this distinction between Guts and Griffith that Miura comments on just how important and powerful personal growth can be. It's why I find Guts to be one of the most inspirational and well-written characters in manga. So if you're going to take anything away from this video, um, don't bottle shit up, don't put on a facade, face the unknown, go into the forest, slay the dragon, and uh, don't make pretentious videos about Berserk. Wait a second. Pokemon.